Psychobabble. I'm your host, Hannah Spear. I first want to take a chance to thank you all for the support and the messages and the subscriptions. I really wouldn't be doing this without you. Today, I'm a little bit nervous about this topic because when I started this, I told myself that I, there were a couple of things I wouldn't touch and the trans transgender issue was one of them. And uh, now I see that I will have come to the to hold the opinion that if you have an audience, if you have a microphone, not touching this is a moral cowardice, especially because, well, I'm based in Switzerland, as you know, and Switzerland, funnily enough, is actually the country in the world that has the highest proportion of transgender individuals, followed closely by Sweden. So we're really seeing the trend here as well. So out of curiosity, I went into the, the to the hospital pages of Basel here in Zurich. Basel does most of the of the surgeries in Switzerland. And because I'm curious, obviously these are new surgeries and procedures. And I wanna know, I always want to know when I go to get a procedure, what are they basing their recommendations on? Uh, what is behind it? Where are the doctors getting their information from? And usually they get it from an association of people who are experts in that field and do nothing else than this procedure that I'm getting. And on the websites of this, these hospitals, they link to uh, something called WPATH, the World Professional Association of Transgender Health. And the second thing that was interesting why I'm doing this now is that recently people from within this organization leaked a bunch of uh, messages from forums within it, video conference calls to a think tank called Environmental Progress. And I'm very honored that today I get to speak to the author of the report called The W Path Files, Mia Hughes, who's a journalist working there. So welcome to Psychobabble, Mia. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. First thing I really want to know is who are these people who are deciding what to do, who are writing these guidelines? It's a really important question if you want to understand this what is going on right now, which I believe is a medical scandal, because the World Professional Association for Transgender Health sits at the very core. And it's a really interesting organization. So they formed in 1978. Mm. Prior to that, there had been um, a very obscure field of medicine, people making various attempts to alleviate the suffering of individuals who feel themselves to be members of the opposite sex or desire to become members of the opposite sex. But in 1978, when they formed, they were originally called Harry Benjamin International Gender Dysphoria Association, HIBICDA, that was the acronym. Right, I heard of Harry Benjamin, yeah. Right, well, Harry Benjamin was one of the key figures in what you could call the second wave of gender medicine that was in the 1950s, 1960s, when... It's starting to become somewhat popular. There was the very sensational case of Christine Jurgensen, who was an American. Few people know this, but he was actually a, a gay man who was very uncomfortable with his homosexuality. And he traveled to Denmark in the 1950s. And under the care of Christian Hamburg, Hamburger, mm -hmm. he um, underwent the, f well, uh, vaginoplasty, I think, or some sort of genital surgery. And he came back to the US transformed. And there was a, a front page headline, you know, blonde bombshell something, mm. you know, this man had transformed into a woman. And this triggered an enormous amount of interest in gender medicine, predominantly from men wishing to be women. And mm. Harry Benjamin was part of that. He was the key figure in that wave. And so he brought together a loose affiliation of people interested in this very obscure field of medicine. And they called themselves the Harry Benjamin International Gender Dysphoria Association. Mm. So I would like to think that in the early days, they were attempting something like a scientific quest to help these individuals who were suffering from a, a condition that causes some distress. But then in the late 1990s, something 
changed. And that's something basically you can look at it as in the late 1990s, the modern trans rights movement began. So this is a group of transgender people who saw that gay rights was about to be one. They saw that the gay rights movement was reaching its close, and they saw that this was their opportunity then for trans rights. So they're all forming in the late 1990s, well, actually in the, in the late 1980s, but by the late 1990s, it's really starting to become a movement. And these individuals are joining WPATH. So activists start to join what was called Hibigda, but is WPATH, in the late 1990s. And the group then takes a turn for the ideological. So they have these standards of care that mm -hmm. they publish, and these are the guidelines that anyone in gender medicine will follow. So standards of care five was published in 1998. This was still something of a scientific medical document. It was not activist led. But then the the group was unhappy with it because it, it classified gender dysphoria, gender distress as a psychiatric disorder. Mm. They weren't happy with this at all. So they immediately commissioned Standards of Care 6, which was published in 2001. And that removed the need for two surgical letters, two, two mental health referral letters. And it you can see the shift then. They're on the track towards trans activism rather mm. than a scientific quest to help people. And as the first decade of the 21st century progresses, they plunge further and further into obvious activism. And then the pivotal moment is 2007. That's when they changed their name. And they, they became the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. It sounds very scientific. It sounds very legitimate. Legitimate. They basically mm. self-identified as the world leading professional association for transgender health. Mm -hmm. what, never really hiding their activism side, but but very much emphasizing that they are scientific and evidence driven when they're not. Right. So they published um, a standards of care seven in 2012. And this is very now ideological. This is um, gender dysphoria is not a mental health issue. It's a, uh, well, being transgender, I suppose, is not a mental health issue. It's a perfectly natural, healthy state of being. And you, you are to affirm the transgender identity. Anything, any attempt to find out where it came from would be conversion therapy, would be transphobic. Any attempt to help the person reconcile with their birth sex, that would be conversion therapy. So it's all about affirmation. And if you start from a point of affirmation that, yes, you are a member of the opposite sex, that's a good thing, a healthy thing, the only place you can really go then is medical transition. Mm -hmm. The only place you can go is hormones and surgeries. You, you can't help the person reconcile. And they're the ones coming up with these terms like affirming and were they the ones who pushed for, because now it's uh, like you, you mentioned, it's not no longer a psychiatric diagnosis. It's not a psychiatric illness. If you feel that you're a boy trapped in a girl's body, it's a psychiatric illness. If that makes you feel uncomfortable. Right. Well, that's the, the diagnosis itself is really interesting. The evolution of the, the diagnosis. So yeah, in the DSM three, we had transsexualism. That was the diagnosis in 1980. Mm. Um, and then DSM four, it became gender identity disorder. Now there, there was a, there was a change, but still the disorder is the mismatched gender identity. It's the not it's the not feeling that your gender identity matches your body. That was the disorder. Now, WPATH's role is crucial in this because they didn't like that at all. Mm. And so they um, lobbied the, the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, who produced the DSM. They lobbied them to change it from gender identity disorder to gender dysphoria. So they were behind that. Oh, very interesting. There's a work group. So I think the DSM was 2013, DSM-5, I think, I'm not sure. And there's about two years prior, there's a WPATH work group that they convened and they got together and they came up with 
gender dysphoria uh, to replace gender identity disorder. And their reasoning, it's, a, it's actually a stroke of genius because then they, they still get to keep the diagnosis. And it's very important if you want insurance to cover your health care in the US, you must have a DSM diagnosis. So they had to find a way to keep the DSM diagnosis without but remove the pathologization of transgender identities. And so they shifted the, the, the diagnosis to the distress. The identity is now not the problem. The identity, it's perfectly natural and healthy to be a man who feels he is a woman. That's natural and healthy. The, the pathology is the distress that you feel because you have this mismatched identity. And then again, why it's brilliant on their part is the only solution is medical transition. And you've got to understand that trans rights is, is all about access to hormones and surgeries. They are, they, you, you always hear about trans rights as being about, um, ending discrimination and, and fighting for this vulnerable minority, but actually really at its core, what trans rights is, is full on-demand access to hormones and surgeries for anyone who wishes it. That's what they campaign for. And with that switch from gender identity disorder to gender dysphoria, they pulled it off. They got what they wanted. But even that, they're not even happy with that because now they think that that's pathologizing. And so if you look at the ICD-11... Mm, yeah, now it's the ICD-11, yeah. It's, it's no longer... It's, there's no distress at all. It's gender incongruence. Yeah, so yeah. basically, you don't even have to feel any distress whatsoever. You just have to identify as a member of the opposite sex and want to modify your body. That's the diagnosis. It's a very dangerous place to be. Um, mm. But back to the, okay, so the standards of care seven, when I said that was 2012, and that was an ideological document, a, a decade passed between standards of care seven and standards of care eight. And when standards of care eight came out, we all saw just how far this organization had plunged into activism and w away from the Hippocratic Oath. We, we, this was a, a remarkable document in that not only did it remove all lower age limits for hormones and surgeries, except for one surgery, which is phalloplasty. We can talk about that later. Mm -hmm. Terrible. Um, but also there was a whole chapter on eunuch as a valid gender identity deserving of surgical and hormonal affirming castration. And then this bizarre chapter on non-binary, and this is, people think non-binary is just, you know, they, them pronouns and silly haircuts, but it's actually, there's a far more sinister side to it. And that is these non-binary surgeries where they'll create, if you if you identify as neither male nor female, they'll create a smooth sexless body. If you identify as both male and female, they'll create a second set of genitals for you. And it's all in WPATH standards of care. I didn't know that. That just took me by surprise. I didn't know they did that. Being active all the time and incorporating that into your everyday life is easier said than done. For me, it really helped when I found Pitch Fitness Center, a premium wellness gym. It's not just your run-of-the-mill fitness center with white walls and vinyl floor smells like a school gym. This place really gives you that hotel spa feeling. And the best thing as a mom is that it has this kids club, which is amazing. My kids really like to go there. We go every day, even on Sundays. It's so good that even when I'm too lazy to work out my kids force me to go anyway and then i go to the wellness area they even have a steam bath a bio sauna a finish sauna and a quiet room where you can lie down i usually fall asleep a little bit and afterwards i feel so pampered and my kids have had the time of their lives go to pitch.ch get a discount with our promo code psychobabble with dr spear that's pitch.ch go and check it out When when we follow guidelines in psychiatry, it's made by uh, 
okay, this is a special case, but let's say, uh, you know, uh, procedures in, in, um, in pediatrics that's decided by pediatric experts, so pediatricians. But this is something completely different. These aren't all doctors. Who, who is in the association? That's what makes WPATH so fascinating is that it's a, it's a professional organization and it's setting the medical standards of care uh, for a very extreme medical pathway. And yet you're right. It's this weird hybrid organization. So you have got on the inside, you have got plenty of medical professionals. So you've got surgeons, endocrinologists, uh, primary care providers, and then you've also got, you've got a lower level, you've got sort of therapists, counselors, social workers, all of them working in the, the field of gender. And then you've got human rights lawyers, or you've got just lawyers. people who, you, oh, you, human rights experts, lawyers, anyone very, very, and we're talking, some of them are very prominent transgender rights, human rights lawyers, you know, they're, they're mm. very they're people with a very extreme ideological position um, and they have no medical training whatsoever. They have very extreme views. They've even these, but these, and again, so this is weird soup of activists mixed with surgeons, which I truly think is a very dangerous combination. I think that's, that's how you end up with the non-binary surgeries is by having these people all mixed together, but they're not just members. The WPATH has even had some of these non-medical human rights experts as their president. You see, the person who was in 2007 the president of WPATH, when it became WPATH, changed its name and went on this very strong political activism campaign, was a trans-identified female who is yeah, a human rights lawyer with very extreme views and a very well-known trans activist called Stephen Whittle in the, like she's in England. And she was one of the ones who was a key figure in the very early days of the modern trans rights movement, who helped shape the modern trans rights movement into what it is, this very sort of reality denying trans women are women, trans men are men, access to medical care is a human right. And she was one of the ones who started this whole movement and then was the president of WPATH in 2007 when it went on this very sharp tangent. And then others have others who are not medical and are basically just trans activists, prominent trans activists have also served as president. So it's a it's a, just a dangerous, dangerous combination in my mind. How many how many documents were there of messages and and calls and when you when you got them? They came in batches. So the first stack I first started writing from Michael Schellenberger last April, I think it was, and almost immediately he got the first stack of WPATH files, and it was about seventy pages at that point of their internal it's an internal messaging forum so the platform is called doc matter and you know doc matter is a place where medical professionals doctors are supposed mm. to congregate and share you know the latest science and discuss patients and how to improve patient health mm. that's really truly not what's happening on wpath's forum so we got the internal messages and i had been writing about WPATH for a number of years when these when this this these files landed on my desk. So part of it for me was not quite as shocking as it was for Michael, who was brand new to the issue. But I will say that I was shocked in that I I knew activism drove this group, but I was shocked to see that on the inside there are WPATH members who are discussing very complicated cases and getting advice from trans activists. I think that's a very dangerous way for a medical field to practice when 
knowing what we know about this debate, this is not the, the gender debate is not a debate known for reasonable discussion, everybody being open to different ideas and everybody. That's not what trans activism is. They are very intolerant of anyone who sh holds a different point of view to the, the core of trans activism. And so there were, it was about 70 pages to start off with. And there was a pattern to it that I noticed right away. It was the original post, the person will show up describing a very difficult case. And this will be a case, it will be like a patient with very complex mental health needs. And the patient always wanted hormones or surgeries. And this therapist, it's normally a therapist who doesn't really know what to do. And they feel something is wrong here. They're like, I'm not sure if this person can deal with the after the the post-op period for vaginoplasty, which is very harsh, very mm. brutal. You have to dilate for hours every single day to keep the wound from closing. It's very difficult. And they're talking about people with schizophrenia. They're talking about people with major depressive disorder, a whole range of psychiatric conditions. And then what what typically happens is a whole chorus of people come along to dispel the doubts. Of course, this person, this person, they're going to be absolutely fine. You can like, if they, if they can consent, if they understand, then they can, there's no reason why these mental health issues would be in the way. And it just ends up being a chorus of people encouraging medical transition for some of the most complex and difficult cases you could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, a very worrying, but very, uh, I shouldn't have been surprised because that is WPATH, but I was surprised that there was so little caution and so little regard for how complex these people were. Yeah, especially coming from from doctors, people who should be literate in uh, reading uh, scientific uh, papers and, and dealing with uh, how to treat people. And uh, yeah, when we talk to each other, it's... Uh, you know, we want to correct, we want the correction. I can't imagine that that was if you have people who are ideologically possessed next to you, who then per definition only think black and white, they wouldn't allow for that correction. How did you see that, uh, that they were ideologically motivated in the, in the back and forths? There's, there are a number of examples. I mean, going back, we don't have to go too far into the non-binary surgeries, but um, there, there's a very bizarre part, and I included it at the very end of my report because I think it is the most extreme example. But they, there was somebody comes along and is talking about um, all of these, the creation, you know, of a second set of genitals, or he's talking about he'll do mastectomies and do customized scars for the person after the mastectomy and things like that. And then he calls them non-standard surgeries or something like that. And then a chorus of people come along. Nobody, first and foremost, what's most notable is that nobody comes along to say, I'm not sure that this is ethically right. I don't know that like these surgeries are going to improve the health of these patients. I'm not sure that this is an ethically sound medical practice. Nobody says that. What actually happens is a whole bunch of people come along and police his language. You know, you, the, it's not it's it's cis heteronormative to call it non-standard because they may become standard in the future and maybe somebody who is binary it's they even they were opposed to calling them non-binary surgeries because what if a binary person wants to have these surgeries and then that means that you can't call them non-binary it was honestly it was just all trans activism and and mind blowing because the person more than one person in the conversation was a surgeon who performs these surgeries we're not talking if this were just trans activists on reddit it would be you know it's, it's different. not it's still yeah. not ideal that people are having these conversations but it's on reddit and it's just you know people having conversations but this is actually surgeons 
mixed in with trans activists. And then the remarkable thing in, in one of the exchanges is the surgeon, and his name, we named him, his Thomas Satterwhite. He's in California. He's one of the most renowned for doing these surgeries. He actually apologizes to the trans activists for his careless language, for calling them non-standard. Oh, I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have called them non-standard. And it's... Okay. It's just, it chills, it, for me, it chilled me to the bone because of what they're talking about. It's, it's like, a, I don't know if you're familiar with the David Cronenberg movies, the, the sort of like no. movies that deal with, and they're kind of like science and, and psychological, very, very sort of intense Sounds films where... Inducing. It, well, they're very actually they're very good films. I'm not one for horror films, and they're not they're, they're they're not quite horror films. But I feel like Life is a David Cronenberg film right now, and that's what that's what you're witnessing. That's what they're yeah. talking about. And but there, there are other examples. I mean, in in one of the examples that I can give, there's a man who is. He's, they're discussing this man and he's, I think he might be schizophrenic or he's got major depressive disorder. He's got, the, the person lists a whole litany of, of mental health issues. And then the lead author, and he's saying, I'm perplexed. I don't know what to do with this man. He wants hormones. He wants estrogen. And, and the, the, the lead author of the mental health chapter of the Standards of Care 8, his name is Dan Karasik. He's a psychiatrist. He shows up and basically says, I, I don't understand why you're perplexed. Uh, the, you know, mental illness doesn't, is no reason why he can't consent to the hormones. And he encourages him to put them, to give the man the referral. And then another person comes along and she says, she's a therapist. And she says, in 15 years, she's obviously encouraging hormones as well, writing the letter. And she's talking about surgical referrals. She says, in 15 years, she's only ever refused one person their surgical referral letter. And that's because they were hallucinating. They were in active psychosis in the assessment and they were hallucinating. You're joking. And she regrets that she had to refuse that person. And then she says something really interesting. She says, Everyone else got their surgical referral and got at least an orchiectomy, that's surgical castration, and is presumably living happily ever after. Pres why presumably? Presumably. You see, that's the thing. They do no follow-up whatsoever of any of their patients. Nobody is... That's not in their standards of care? Standards of care, no. As far as I am aware, they do not even recommend follow-up. If you look, there's something remarkable about the science, supposed science in the field of gender medicine, and it is that they do no follow-up. We've got no long-term follow-up studies, no gender clinics do any follow-up. And then this therapist, okay, so in 15 years, all the people she sent off for surgical castration and genital surgery, she is presuming that they're all living happily ever after, just assuming. <laughs> And I think it's probably quite safe to say that many of them are not because no. there's no gatekeeping, there's no caution, there's no, there's no regard for their long-term health, their mental health issues. It's just so hormones and surgeries on demand without any care for what becomes of them. That is insane, especially considering more than 40% of those identifying as transgender have underlying psychiatric illnesses. And uh, my guess is there it's higher, but that was what I saw. And they would definitely need, I mean, maybe we should now go over some of these these surgeries that they that we're talking about that they're getting i think we just have to talk about it we'll talk about the the standard surgeries first so in gender medicine there is there's a it's a strange thing i think because when a person transitions most most of the people who undergo medical transition because they feel that there is gender incongruence in their, they feel incongruence with their body and mind, they will only have hormone therapy. Most of them do not undergo the genital surgeries. Women will have, it's very common to have the bilateral mastectomy, which is in 
in and of itself a, a major surgery that mm -hmm. is euphemistically called top surgery. And these poor young women don't have any idea what how major a bilateral mastectomy is until they've had it done. I have heard the, the devastating story so many times from detransitioned young women that they realized they'd made a mistake when they woke up from the surgery because there was something so brutal about the gashes across their chest. And they often have these drains coming out because yeah. there's a lot of fluid mm -hmm. and they've got these gashes and these drains and they're, you know, they're teenage girls. They're like 17, 18, maybe like 20 years old. Mm -hmm. And nobody, if you look on TikTok, if you look on YouTube at all the trans influencers, they're dancing around and they're showing off their scars. This is giving these young women, these teenage girls and young yeah. women, a very unrealistic mm -hmm. idea of what this surgery is. It's a major surgery. And of course, mm -hmm. they are, you know, they're, they're teenagers. They very mm -hmm. likely, if they don't regret it when they wake up from the surgery, it's possible that when they hit 30, 35, whatever, if they have children, they'll really truly at that point realize what they've lost because they won't be able to breastfeed their children. There's a detransitioned young woman who just had a baby and posted a photograph of herself holding her newborn baby crying because she realized that what she had lost at that moment when she can't breastfeed her newborn baby these 17 year old girls, I was 17 once, I hmm. would never have, having children was not even on my radar. I would never ever want to have children. And then when I hit 30, I had, you know, baby fever hit me. I ended up having three children. I was breastfeeding and co-sleeping and because nobody stole that chance away from me mm -hmm. by chopping off my healthy breasts. Yeah, we're realizing it later and later. And we have to give them a chance. I mean, I said all kinds of things as a 17-year-old. And that just uh, makes you wonder. I guess we have to ask the question, what happens in that doctor's office when you come in, you have your parent with you? What are these parents uh, told? And how are they how are they consenting to this, the, the parent and the, the teenager? Right. But for me, I mean, there are people out there who blame the parents. I am not one of them. It's different if you've got the type of parent, like the Jazz Jennings type parent. I don't know if you know who, like the, the reality yes. TV, TV show, the mother transitioned him when he was like four or five years old. That's a different set of parents. But if we're talking this adolescent onset, probably you can call it rapid onset gender dysphoria, but that's contested. These are basically the adolescents who are caught up in today's social contagion. And I feel very comfortable saying that it's a, a psychiatric epidemic. These parents, it, it, it's unbelievable that it, that it is happening, but it's been t the, the story has been told so many times that we know it's true, that these parents will be told in the in the clinics and in the gender clinics they'll be given the ultimatum would you rather a live son or a dead daughter so they'll show up with their teenage daughter who suddenly decided that she's a boy she wants testosterone she wants her breast cut off the parents don't know what to do they have no idea they show up at the gender clinic and they're not comfortable with with consenting and somebody some despicable therapist, endocrinologist, whoever is saying this, it is the most despicable form of emotional blackmail, not grounded at all in any science whatsoever. And they will say, would you rather a live son or a dead daughter? Now, it would take a very, very strong-willed parent to, to still not consent at that point, because they've just been told that if they say no, their child could kill themselves. Of course they're going to consent, but that's not informed consent. That's, that's consent blackmail. under duress. That is yeah. actual emotional blackmail. Mm. And already prior to, like recently a, couple, a study came out adding weight to the fact that there's no truth to this lie whatsoever. It's called the transition or suicide myth, that the lie. There's no truth to it. We've known basically all along, like the trans 
the trans activists push transition or suicide. They push it and they push it because it's a way to weaponize suicide so that they can have all of their political demands met. But I think there's another darker, more sinister side to the transition or suicide myth. And that is, if you think about the treatment protocol, gender affirming care, mm. it involves um, destroying a healthy functioning bodily system. It involves destroying the endocrine system with very powerful drugs. It then involves creating a lifelong medical patient, somebody who is going to be dependent on powerful hormones for the rest of their lives. It often can result in sterility. So it involves chemical castration. And somewhere down the line, it very often involves the amputation of body parts. So this is a treatment protocol that it's fair to say that this would be comparable to cancer treatment. Okay. Mm. But cancer treatment is a life or death situation. You can justify sterilizing a child if they have cancer and the other option is they will die. And I think the transitional suicide myth is so crucial to the modern trans rights movement because they advocate for healthy children to be put on a treatment pathway as extreme as cancer treatment. And because they do that, they need these children, to their lives to be at risk. They need it to be a life or death situation. So they have, so they push the transition or suicide lie onto society so that we will support it, onto parents so that they will consent. In the medical world, they push it because it justifies what they're doing to these children. How could they justify sterilizing a child if the child's life were not at risk? They simply couldn't. So they need the children to be suicidal. They need to believe that they are. Otherwise, they lose medical justification for what they're doing to these young people. Yeah. But the truth is, it's just not that, that, that statistically we do not have, there's no evidence to suggest that there's any truth to it whatsoever. And, and as well, when you repeatedly tell, I'm sure you, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, but the way I see it is with suicide being somewhat socially contagious, socially influenced, if you repeatedly tell a vulnerable at risk group that they are at risk of suicide, you tell them that to be trans is to be suicidal. If you are trans, you're, you're, you're going to be suicidal. And if you don't get access to this treatment right away, you're going to be suicidal. I think mm -hmm. that puts them at greater risk of actually being suicidal because you're planting the idea into a very vulnerable Absolutely. mind and telling them that the normal response to being transgender and not getting what they want is being suicidal. I'm, I'm against even the advertisement for the suicidal helplines, to be quite honest, because it's all, you know, the word, it's there, it, the road to hell is, is paved with good intentions. What they're not talking about, obviously, is the, the suicide risk among any psychiatric group is is very high and then add to that depression having a, a botched surgery a, a wound where your penis should have been and dealing with a with looking at infertility and all of that of course then 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 that risk increases but what it, when you read this document are there any concerns about having met parents who are asking questions or being critical or, you know, them asking, what what do we do about this? Or are you sure about, you know, that they understand it? There's not a lot of talk about, let me think, there's not a lot of talk about parents in there, if I remember correctly. There is, there is a lot of talk about the adolescents themselves. Mm. There are some very, I mean, there are two parts that are very difficult to read or to watch um, because one part is a panel discussion where they talk about adolescents. And so in the panel discussion, that we're, there's like a leaked video. And again, it's prominent WPATH members, one of whom was a former president of WPATH. And it's one of those ones who is not um, a medical professional. I think, I think she's a human rights expert as well, a, another trans-identified female. And then there's an endocrinologist who is a very prominent Canadian endocrinologist. 
and, and a child psychologist and a therapist in there. And they're all talking about these adolescents consenting, basically the difficulty of children and adolescents consenting to being sterilized is, is basically the issue that they're dealing with. And so the, the Canadian pediatric endocrinologist who is in his day job, he actively places young people onto this medical pathway. He will say, he says something, you know, like it's very difficult because we're explaining these things to young, to kids who haven't even had high school biology yet. So they'll come in and they want a deeper voice, but they don't want facial hair. They want to pick and choose what effects they get from the hormones because they're children, right? They don't understand how their endocrine system works. They don't understand how powerful testosterone is. They're children. So he, he is aware of that. They haven't had high school biology yet and they're picking and choosing. And then he says, you know, talking to a 13 year old about fertility preservation is like talking to a blank wall. They'll say, Ooh, babies gross. Of course, because I was once a 13 year old and I would have had that too. And, and so he's saying the things that we all see, he's, he's highlighting the difficulties. He understands everything that we understand. And so it's a really bizarre thing. You almost have to keep reminding yourself that this is the person who is putting these children onto this medical pathway. He sees just as well as we do how impossible it is, that it is like talking to a blank wall. Teenagers don't understand these things. And then even more chilling is later in the conversation, he says, so the, the Dutch are the ones who started this whole medical experiment, right? In an, Amsterd in an Amsterdam clinic in the 1980s was when this whole child transition experiment was conceived. And so the Dutch have the first long-term follow-up study of the young people who were chemically, oh, these I think were surgically castrated actually as teenagers. And they're now in their thirties mm -hmm. and there's high fertility regret. They, their fertility loss, it's 27% regret sacrificing their fertility. They regret I think the Dutch worded it, they find their infertility troublesome or something like that. Troublesome. 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 Um, and, but then if you look closer at the numbers, it's even higher. Like I think 56% could be considered as not being very happy with the fact that they cannot have children. And so he brings up this study. He's in the conversation and he's saying, I saw this study and there's fertility regret. And he says... And I don't think that surprises any of us. And then he says, I know that there's regret because I see it in the young adolescents who come through in their 20s. They'll come back to me and they'll say, I've met someone and I want to settle down. And, and he says to them, he says, he tells the group, he says to them, oh, the dog's not doing it for you anymore, is it? Meaning... They were adolescents and they thought they'd always be happy with a dog. I'll never want children. I'll always be happy just having a dog. They get into their 20s. They've met someone. They want to settle down. They want to have children. And he says to them, oh, the dog's not doing it for you anymore, is it? The callousness of it cannot be overstated. But then, you know, everyone in that panel discussion was in the report. And I've talked about this rather a lot in interviews. But then we, we saw the, an internal, oh no, it wasn't. It was a WPATH member was interviewed by a journalist, Benjamin Ryan. And the WPATH member told the journalist that those people having that discussion inside WPATH, they are the heroes of WPATH. They're not the way I apparently like that they, they were the ones on the inside grappling with all the difficulties of consent with children and everything. And they are, they are now being held up as heroes inside the group, which is a clear indication of how corrupt this group is hmm. that they can, they can look at that conversation between medical professionals who are actually putting these young people onto this medical pathway and they can still think that those are the heroes 
So what was the response in the in the group when he, uh, to this um, when the difficulty of consent came up? No, but okay. So all they do in this in this panel discussion is discuss how difficult it is because they know that the young people don't understand. There's a one in there. She's a child psychologist. She was a, a co-author of WPATH Standards of Care 8 child chapter. And she talks about how difficult it is to explain fertility um, loss to a nine-year-old. She says, oh, it's got me stumped. You know, I'm stumped. Okay. But nobody... At least someone's talking about it. Right. Okay. We're talking about it. But honestly, with that conversation to me, it should, that conversation should have gone only in one direction. We should not be doing this to these children. You mm -hmm. can't talk about fertility loss to a nine-year-old. You simply nope. can't. But then back to the Canadian endocrinologist, he basically spells it out what's going on inside their minds because he's talking about like talking to a blank wall and I see the regret they come back and he's like he even talks about how he understands that if you block the puberty of an adolescent you are robbing them of he uses the word robbing he he says you're robbing them of that crucial sexual development that is going on in their peers so you're basically you're taking them out of step with their peers. They're not going through that crucial sexual development that everyone in their age group is. And he says, and that troubles me, but I just want them to be happy in the moment. I just want in to make moment. them happy. And that's the problem. These individuals, all of them, I truly don't believe they're evil people. They are just looking at it they, they're prioritizing the present at the expense of the future. They are not looking at the next five decades of this young person's life. They see an adolescent in terrible pain and they want to make that adolescent happy and they want to resolve that pain. And so because, I'll, I'll maybe go off on a tangent here, but please. It, if, um, so I've been thinking a lot about this now because of where we are in the scandal. So this individual, this endocrinologist and all like him, at some point in the past, he made the decision to go down the gender affirming care pathway. He got his first patient and he affirmed that patient and he put the probably 12 year old, 13 year old on a medical pathway towards chemical castration, sterilization, probably body part amputation. And with even with that first patient, that had to be the right decision because he's just basically sterilized a child. And if you sterilize a child as a doctor, you have to have made the right decision. That must have been the right decision. So he would have self-justified. Mm. Every patient that he put on that pathway with the best intentions, because he sees a patient in distress and he wants to help that patient, he's not setting out to ruin lives. He's doing it with the best intentions. He has to self-justify that this is the right gender-affirming care saves lives. Gender-affirming care is helping these young people. He has to self-justify to the point now where we're in 2024. I know that this man, he started doing this in like the late 1990s. So every patient that he has put on that medical pathway, he has self-justified so that now he basically lives in this fortress of his own making where no evidence can change his mind because he is, if you've sterilized a hundred kids, you have to be right. Yeah. He's built himself a house of cards and now so he's terrified of it falling down. Right. So there's a wonderful, um, Megan McArdle is a Washington Post journalist. I've, I tweeted about this the other day. Last year, she wrote a wonderful article about um, the Oedipus trap, where it was about Walter Freeman, the man who invented the transorbital lobotomy, and how Freeman went to his grave convinced that the transorbital lobotomy was a gift to humanity. 
He really? even drove, oh, he even drove around the US in the last years of his life while he had metastatic cancer and he was dying. He drove around the US tracking down all of the people he had lobotomized, looking for proof that it was a beneficial gift to humanity and all these people were happy and thriving. And so he was bringing himself face to face with his victims, but he could not see the harm that he had done. And Megan McArdle calls this the Oedipus trap after the Greek, m m the story from Greek mythology, mm -hmm. Oedipus, he, he kills his father. Oh no, he kills his father, no. he marries his mother. And then when he realizes what he's done, he gouges his own eyes out because there are some mistakes so terrible, you cannot look at them. Better to gouge out your own eyes than to look upon the terrible mistake that you've made. And mm. I think these doctors at this point, that's where they are. They've, There's they've, no way they've, back. This, they've sent so many young people, healthy, innocent young people, down a medical pathway that has robbed them of their fertility, likely healthy parts of their body. And they, these doctors now, they cannot look upon the ruined lives. They can't look at the victims. So they've got to keep themselves protected in this fortress of their own making they've got to they, they cannot look at the evidence now this is i don't know how much longer they can keep this up because last week we had the cas report out of england now that's a f the the product that comes after four years of deep thorough investigation yeah please uh, could you say some words about the cas report since that's that's new Okay, so four years, it's been going on for four years. It was conducted by Dr. Hilary Cass. She is, she was a pediatrician. She was actually the president of, a former president of the Royal College of, I think it's called Pediatrics and Child Health. And she was commissioned by the NHS to conduct an independent review of the youth gender service. That's the Gender Identity Development service in the infamous Tavistock clinic in London. So this was a centralized service where all of the children in England, Wales, and I think even Northern Ireland would go through this one clinic if they suffered from gender issues. And of course, it's been in the news for years now. The, the, they had their first, the first people to raise the alarm. There was a woman called Sue Evans who raised the alarm, I think in 2005, maybe 2006, way back in the beginning, and no one listened to her. People gradually, over the years, people raised the alarm, nobody listened. It was very ideologically driven, very, very politically motivated, just like WPATH, corrupt on the inside because it's being driven by the, the desires of transgender activists, trans rights activists, not science and evidence. Mm -hmm. And so um, the CAS review was launched in 2020. We now have the final verdict. And it is basically, for those of us watching it, there aren't many surprises. They are recommending, first of all, they found absolutely no good quality evidence for this gender affirming pathway, basically puberty blockers. Even they even looked at social transition, which is change of name, mm. pronouns, mm. Um, telling the young person, affirming and the young person. Social? Sorry, on and only social. Sorry, only uh, the the kids who only did the social transition without hormones, without uh, surgeries. They're advising caution even with social transition, which is great. Interesting, because that is what I hear from parents often, that, yeah, well, you know, it's just, you know, <clears throat> the changing of the name just so that they don't get depressed for being misgendered. It's, you see, what I love about CAS, because I've had a thing about social transition for a long time, is it talks about how this is not a neutral act telling a child, letting them change their name and pronouns and affirming them as a member of the opposite sex. Obviously, we shouldn't need to be told, but we do need to be told that this is, this is not a neutral act. This is something that has a very powerful psychological effect on the child and can make it actually rather difficult to then walk it back. You know, maybe mm -hmm. when you're 12, you really do. Maybe a 12-year-old girl really does think she's a boy. 
so she changes her name and she goes by he him but that can be what if she has some doubts it's not that easy to just say oh actually so, i'm going to yeah, change my wrong. name back i was wrong yeah. I, it's it's a it's really embarrassing so you rather course. keep on doing it yeah so you kind of lock yourself into it and and so imagine the effect it would have on a five-year-old. Imagine there's a five-year-old boy like Jazz Jennings who loves princess gowns and sparkly bathing suits, so his mother tells him that that makes him a girl, gives him a girl name, calls him she, her pronouns, puts him in dresses, sends him to school as a girl and repeatedly tells him he's a girl. Of course he's going to think he's a girl because he's a child and children yeah. believe adults when the especially when it's probably again good intentions you are you are relieving the distress in the moment probably mm. it's not that easy for a very effeminate boy kids are mean if you stand out and you don't fit in with all the boys maybe yeah. they are mean to you so you're relieving the child's distress in the moment and that child probably is much happier right now living as a girl because it means they fit in now but it again it's at the expense of the future you're not looking at this child's future you're not looking at how difficult life will be as a a, a male presenting as a female it's it's not an easy life that you're choosing for your child so cas it's great in that they recommend caution caution for social transition it's not something it's not neutral it's it has a very powerful effect and it can make medical transition far more likely and that's not nothing mm -hmm. and then they found absolutely no good quality evidence for puberty blockers again this is not new this is nothing new if you've been mm -hmm. following this debate there has never been good quality evidence for puberty blockers. The entire experiment was, there's a wonderful article that was published in 2022. It's an academic article, um, and it's called The Myth of Reliable Research. And they talk about how the puberty blockers experiment escaped the lab. So basically, when in 2011 and 2014 are the two pivotal studies, they were that was innovative medicine that was not a controlled trial that was not you know this was not rigorous science this was just a crazy experiment that they came up with very methodologically flawed and very dubious results and what should have happened after those two experiments these are the pivotal linchpin experiments of the entire puberty suppression experiment when those results came out there should have then been a series of rigorous controlled trials to test whether they could replicate the findings of these original studies. But that didn't happen. People just took those studies as scientific proof that puberty suppression was not only safe, but also beneficial and effective. And it just burst out into mainstream medicine. And the really really dangerous part is that happened at the exact same moment this experiment escaped the lab at the exact same moment that the modern trans rights movement triggered the social contagion of gender dysphoria because if you look at any of the graphs 2014 is the year of the spike mm. so you've got you know adolescents hardly any adolescents are identifying as transgender 2014 hits and then it's just exponential yeah. growth we see it in gender clinics all over the world but yeah. 2014 is the moment that the medical experiment the puberty blockers experiment escaped the lab and into mainstream practice so these two very devastating things collided and caused the medical scandal that we are seeing today so there's never been any evidence for puberty suppression at all and that's what CAS found, basically. So the NHS are no longer going to be offering puberty blockers outside of a clinical trial setting. This episode is also sponsored by Violet Nails, where I've been going to for years. It has a bunch of things from eyebrows and massages, mani pedis, and it's all, the result is always so smooth and elegant. And the, the best thing, I think, is that the treatment never lasts longer than planned which is important when you have places to go and kids and all of that. You can sit in a massage chair while you get your treatment and listen to music. It's a really good time out. So go to the link below and check it out.
What has the response been? The response, we, there was a big response in um, the UK to the report. Canada, I'm in Canada. So Canada, the US, there was less coverage, less of a, a response. The, I can't say that so far health authorities have, as a result of our report, ditched WPATH. They, they have not. Because if you look at CAS, that was four years of very, very rigorous investigation to come out with this report. In the world of healthcare, this is there are no knee-jerk reactions. It's not as if a health authority is going to look at my report and be, oh, we should get rid of WPATH immediately. Obviously, I think that's what they should do, but things have to be, things are much slower in real life. And so I would hope that people will have read my report, people who make decisions about healthcare, people who are the people in charge, I hope have read the report and therefore have realized that WPATH is not what it makes itself out to be. It's, it is a political activist group and it has absolutely no business setting the standards of care for an entire field of medicine. And you see, Europe is pulling away, though. It, at one time, it would have been accurate to say that WPATH is internationally respected and people, nations all over the world look to WPATH to, for how to treat people who suffer from gender dysphoria, but that's not true anymore. Uh, many European nations have already pivoted away from WPATH's oh, that's good. ideological, oh, for sure. I mean, Sweden and Finland have, were the first two nations to do the systematic review. That's where you take all the evidence for a treatment protocol and you assess it um, for the, give it, you grade it and give it, you know, to, to decide whether this is a, a safe evidence-based treatment protocol or not. Sweden and Finland already did that, found Again, no evidence whatsoever for puberty blockers. Um, also, cross-sex hormones. There's no evidence to suggest that cross-sex hormones, puberty blockers, and then cross-sex hormones is safe for adolescents. And so Sweden and Finland had already pivoted away from WPATH. Other nations, England now the same, the CAS report has, has done the same, pivoting away from WPATH. Many European nations, the same thing, just based upon, you see, not every nation needs to do what Sweden, Finland, and England have done. You don't need to keep reinventing the wheel. If three nations have done very rigorous systematic reviews, and all of the systematic reviews have shown the same thing, you know, Canada could do a systematic review tomorrow, but it would only find the same results because you're looking at the same evidence and there's only one possible conclusion to reach when you look at this evidence, and that is that it is garbage. There's no evidence whatsoever. And so every single nation that looks at the evidence does the same thing. They hmm. stop. They stop this medical experiment. They pivot away. England, I think Sweden and Finland, perhaps the same thing. It's not an outright ban on puberty blockers. It's puberty blockers will be available in the strictest of clinical trial settings. The issue there is I don't know how such a trial could ever be set up because trials have to be approved by ethics boards. And at this point in 2024, we really do know that puberty suppression is not safe for these mm. young people. We know that the chances that these young people, to, for the puberty suppression experiment to work and to be safe, you would actually have to be able to select which young person would continue in their transgender identity into adulthood. Mm. And we already know that that is absolutely, completely impossible. You cannot choose which young person. There's no way to tell. So you're already going to have false positives. And it's a false, it's a false positive, but you're putting the young person onto a medical pathway that could leave them sterile, could mean that they lose body parts, that we know that there's a risk of osteoporosis. We know that those detrimental effects are cognitive development effects. 
and then all the other unknown effects. I mean, there's talk in the WPATH files of a, a young person on testosterone who died of cancer. There's, there's, there are risks of heart disease, cancer, strokes that come with the cross-sex hormones. Awful PID and awful post-operative infections. The vaginal, I, I, that is one of the worst parts for me. So writing about the, the effects of testosterone on the female body. Yeah, they're never going to get orgasms. That does us to don't understand that they're never going to be able to connect with the partner in a relationship because they're never going to have intimacy. And I mean, vaginal atrophy is something that always happens with testosterone, but it's not talked about. Right. They, oh, they really, really don't understand what they are consenting to. They don't understand what they're signing away. And these gender affirming clinicians are not telling them. And so what what really is the tragedy of it more than anything else though is that they if we just left them alone if we just allowed them to experiment be teenagers try on different identities try on different hats experiment as much as you like but just no irreversible medical treatments. We are medicalizing mm. a youth subculture, basically. They are just teenagers doing what yeah. teenagers do. And we, in our madness, are allowing these doctors, these ideologically driven doctors, to medicalize their transient teenage identity. And there's nothing more... It's It's unforgivable in that like in the report, I talk about lobotomies, and I know that everybody's always comparing this to lobotomies. But the reason that I think this is worse than lobotomies is because with lobotomies, you really can see how lobotomies happened. At mm. the time, 1940s, if you had a mental illness, it, the outlook was pretty bleak for you. You could either be confined to a mental asylum where the conditions were utterly deplorable. Some, you know, some people were chained to a wall, surrounded by their own filth. And sadists. It was absolutely horrible. Ice baths and um, we're not proud of psychiatric history. So, so we bury it. Well, this is it. I mean, look at the other treatments that they had before the lobotomy, electroshock treatment. We've got malaria therapy, giving them malaria so that the high fever would somehow, I think it was because, was it syphilis? The, the malaria therapy did actually work for, the, 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 for syphilis. It would kill the syphilis bacteria and therefore cure them. But there's a certain sort of madness that comes with syphilis. And so you can see why they came up with malaria therapy, but it did not work for most mental illnesses. They had insulin coma therapy, where mm. the, the convulsions would be so violent that they would break bones. Some of them coming out of this coma would, would break bones because they convulsed so, so intensely. Um, all sorts of really, really bad violent, brutal therapies. Mm -hmm. And then along comes the lobotomy and it leaves the person docile. It leaves them calm and they can leave the mental asylum. They're not chained to a wall anymore. They can be cared for at home by their loved ones. So you can see why the world at the time was so desperate. They were desperate for something that was less violent. And they were desperate for the individuals to be able to go home and be cared for. So yeah. they turned a blind eye. They looked away from the fact that these victims were left in a childlike state of dependency. Many of them were completely unable to look after themselves. And they basically had their humanity destroyed. Everybody looked the other way yeah. because they were so desperate. But the thing about now, why I say this is much worse is because... All of these young people, like the girl in the emergency room with her vaginal atrophy, like the, the individual who wants to have a surgical castration, none of them are chained to walls in mental asylums. None of them are being subjected to electroshock therapy or insulin coma therapy. They're just very confused people who have come to the wrong conclusion because they are living in a time where the modern trans rights movement tells them that their distress is a sign that they are transgender. And a 
medical world that has lost its moral and ethical compass is doing them terrible harm. Mm. But actually, all they need, particularly the young ones, they just need to be left alone. They just need to be given the chance to grow and mature and reach Uh, adulthood fully developed adulthood in you know your mid-20s even sometimes later can take until age 30 to really settle into who you are they just need to be left alone they don't they don't yeah we also have the data for that that left alone they do most of them end up being same-sex attracted and I've, I've, I've spoken to uh, older gay men couples where they say thank god we didn't come come up now, uh, you know, we would also have been told we're just trapped in a woman's body. You know, thank God we were left alone. Right. I mean, there's two, there's, yeah, there's so many. There's two reasons why I think lesbians were the first group in society to really see the problem that we have here. One, because men who identify as women were invading lesbian spaces because the men who are heterosexual men who identify as women believe themselves to be lesbians they believe themselves to be women attracted to women they think they're lesbians so the men i invaded the lesbian spaces but at the same time so many of the lesbians will say if i were growing up now i would be sucked into this i would be medicalized i would be on testosterone i would be wanting my breasts cut off because that's basically what we're telling them if you are a girl who is masculine that means you're a boy that's how that's how sexist regressive and homophobic it is at its core and yet we somehow have people marching in the streets waving rainbow flags as if it's a progressive movement when there could not actually be a more regressive idea in society. And so, yes, a lot, I think the first wave of the social trend, the social contagion girls were, uh, no, children, in fact, they were all majority homosexual. But then as the social contagion expanded and this is the internet has a large part to play in this it, it's spreading on um first in tumblr and then it burst out of tumblr and into tiktok youtube it's less it's, it's not as uh, there are it's broadened at this point so there are het- heterosexual girls and boys who are getting caught up in it as well it's a very complex group you can't just put the label trends onto this one group of people that has totally different members. You've got you've got homosexual boys who are very effeminate, who are being told that they're girls. You've got homosexual girls who skew more to the masculine side. They're being told that they're boys. Then you've got just the kids on the spectrum be it boy or girl, uh, they're on the the autism spectrum, they are interpreting their social difficulties as a sign that they are transgender. And to them, I think the rigid thinking as well, boys Mm. like blue, girls like pink. So if I'm a girl and I like blue, I must be a boy. The rigid black and white thinking perhaps makes sense to them as well. But also it's a way to deal with their social difficulties. So they have, they don't fit in. They don't have very many friends. They're really struggling in school. And then they, they, if they come out as transgender, they instantly find their tribe. They're welcomed into the, the rainbow club and everybody celebrates them and everybody love bombs them. And suddenly right. they, yeah. they become the popular. Bombs. Yeah. And they get all of the likes and the attention that they yeah. so desperately crave because every adolescent does so desperately crave the the approval of their peers. And it's 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 they're not doing it for that. I, I don't believe it's a malicious plan or anything. They they're lonely. We're all lonely and they go if you go in and look at these TikTok videos, you hear that it's tribal in nature. You hear 
the words that they use, the symbolism, it's all wanting to belonging to a group, no matter what that group does or, or is. Right. And if you look at the messaging of it as well, you know, like if they, if am I trans, put in am I trans onto the Google search. And it can be things like you don't fit in with the peer, peers of your of your sex. You know, you're, you're, you're a social outcast. You have trouble fitting in. It's very easy for the autistic kid or, or any adolescent in distress to look at the list that comes up when you type in I am trans and to select things that make sense in their own lives. They, they are self-diagnosing because basically... All you need to be to give yourself a diagnosis of being trans is to be in puberty. It's basically puberty. It's this horrible time in your life. Do you hate your secondary sex characteristics? Yes, I do. Okay, you could be trans. Find yeah. me one, one adolescent in puberty who would not say, who could not diagnose themselves as trans. If you look at the list, it's just all it is is basically the the kids who are not thriving the kids who are having a hard time they're looking for an answer they don't know why they feel so terrible they don't know why they're so distressed and then they just so happen to fall into the wrong place on the internet that tells them all of their problems are because they are trans and the most dangerous part is it gives them a solution it's got the remedy is right there all you need to do is come out as trans Take testosterone and your life will be fixed. Your You'll life will be magical. You can be a new person. You can mm. cast away that person who had no friends, who was isolated, who was struggling in every way. You can get rid of that person and you can be a brand new person. And the YouTube trans influencers make it look all so, you know, sparkles and rainbows. On TikTok, mm. it's all sold to them. Everybody's bouncing around and happy. They're doing their testosterone shots on the videos. They're showing off their scars. Oh, and disturbing. everyone looks really happy. It's, it's, this, it's very alluring to mm. them. So, of course, in their world, it seems like the miracle cure. But yeah. none of it's none of it's real, of course. It's they're getting sucked into something much bigger than they could possibly understand. Mm. And the medical world colludes. The medical world commits this terrible crime by affirming. Exactly. And uh I think the psychiatric community especially uh, we're especially responsible for letting this uh, uh, spiral. And uh, that's the background of why, why I'm doing this. I want to expose some of the fallacies, some of the false narratives that are in the psychological and psychiatric environment. And I think because you've done a deep dive into psychiatric history, could you tell us what we can learn, especially related to this newest mental health crisis? I think, I mean... First and foremost, I don't know if this is going to upset anyone in the psychiatric community, but... Upset away. <laughs> so the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM, it is largely a work of fiction, isn't it? I mean, if you look at the creation of the DSM, there's a, a wonderful book, Crack. I can't remember the subtitle, but the, the author is James Davis. He's done a, He's written a wonderful book about the history of psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And so the DSM, it's largely a work of fiction in that it's, it's consensus, right? It's, it's expert consensus. So if you take any DSM diagnosis and, you know, he interviewed, I think it's Robert Spitzer was the lead of the DSM-3 in 1980. James Davis interviewed him and asked him, you know, whatever the diagnosis for depression is, it's something like you have to having these feelings for four weeks, I think it is. And so he asked Spitzer, why, why four weeks? Why not two weeks? Why not six weeks? Why mm. is it four weeks? And he said, well, that's just, that's what people in the room thought at the time. Everybody thought four weeks was better than you needed. It, it was better than six weeks. It's just consensus. It's just whoever happens to be on that committee in yeah. that room at the time, they're all like throwing around ideas and then they write it down. It's so imprecise. Mm. And so you've got 
I don't know how many diagnoses there are now in the DSM-5. It's It grows and grows and grows with every edition. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's 200 something. I just looked that up because I thought that was interesting why we keep getting it's diluted and diluted. And I'll check it afterwards and, and write it in the, in the description for you guys. Now, I just, I've just remembered, I read a gorgeous analogy. This is, this is really lovely for understanding um, the, the diagnoses in the DSM. So there's a, a psychologist, Paula J. Kaplan, who once said, you can think about these diagnoses as star constellations. So if throughout history, in various cultures, at various times, people have looked up at the night sky and they've joined certain stars together to form constellations. And so people in different cultures can look up at the same night sky, but see different constellations because their cultures have taught them to, to join different stars together into different forms. And she says, you can think about mental health diagnoses in the same way that in perhaps in, you know, in our culture, we join together these four symptoms and we call it borderline personality disorder. And we join together these three and we call it ADHD. But in a different part of the world, those would not make any sense to people. A different part of the world, they would join together different symptoms and give it a different name. And so we are just, we are taking the normal responses to the struggles of life and we are joining them together and creating a mental health diagnosis. And then we apply that label to a person or they apply it to themselves. And then there is a medical, usually there's a medical treatment that goes with it. But there's a really crucial part that comes with it, that comes from the work of a philosopher, Ian Hacking. And that is when a person is given a diagnosis or if they give themselves the diagnosis, that is then going to actually shape how they behave and how they view themselves. So if you, I've seen it, I've seen it in, I have children and some of their friends will get an ADHD diagnosis. I've seen this more than once. And yeah. after the child gets, it's a child, we're talking like a nine-year-old, yeah. a 10-year-old. After they get the ADHD diagnosis, I've heard them say, they'll be like, you know, spaced out, not listening, whatever. And then it's like, you know, got to do this. And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I wasn't listening. I, I have ADHD. Yeah, And exactly. it's almost like the, 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 the symptoms become stronger because it's like, okay, now I have ADHD and this is how people with ADHD behave. So I'm going to behave like that. And it's a, it's a feedback loop. It's hacking calls it the looping effect of humankind. And so these diagnoses as well, it's crucial to understand that they're always shifting. So like maybe somebody with ADHD 10 years ago would behave in this way, but as more and more people were diagnosed with ADHD and they brought their own little quirks to it, then the diagnosis itself starts to expand and evolve. And yeah. it's this complex interplay between the field of psychiatry creating the illnesses really are creating them. They're not real in the sense of diabetes or cancer. It's, there's no biological marker. It just depends on the culture within psychiatry at the time. And then they're applying it to people who then they shape their lives through that diagnosis. I mean, multiple personality disorder, you must, anyone in the field of psychiatry, I'm not sure I'm really not sure how the field of psychiatry was able to completely forget that multiple personality disorder happened and then leap straight into another utterly mad moment. As soon as multiple personality was over, you had a few years where the field of psychiatry was once again reasonably sane and not harming anyone, and then off we go with, with gender. But multiple personality disorder, will, it, I think it's the perfect example of psychiatry created it. it. It did not exist. It did not exist at all. It was not real. And then the field of psychiatry created it. It appears in the DSM 
in 1980, the DSM-3. Mm. And that was, you know, they, the, the, the people who were pro, there was a movement, the, the recovered memory movement. It was a political movement. And they lobbied to get this diagnosis into the DSM-3. And once it was in the DSM-3, then psychiatrists, therapists who were believers, they spread it. They, they started the contagion. They spread the epidemic. Yeah, it it was, got into pop culture. Of course. I mean, it was, we've got the book Sybil. We, well, psychiatrists have fault because it then rebrands, repackaged. Now it's called DID. It's called the Dissociative Identity Disorder. And it's one of the most popular hashtags on TikTok. I was obsessed with multiple personality because it's so, that scandal, that epidemic is so like now, so like the gender that you could, you could just, you could take a book written about the multiple personality disorder epidemic. You could just basically change the, the diagnosis of MPD for gender and you'd basically have an accurate book about gender. Oh, really? It's so similar. But then, yeah, you're right. Dissociative identity disorder is the new name for it. And yes, it is a TikTok trend, but I've got to say, I don't think we're looking at an epidemic like what we had in the 1980s and 1990s. I don't, I'm not actually worried that we're going to see something like that happen again, because for these epidemics to happen, you need certain cultural you need a certain cultural environment in which okay. for, for the that? well, it's really again if we I'll go back to it's the philosopher Ian Hacking who wrote about he wrote extensively about the multiple personality disorder epidemic, and he actually has this gorgeous metaphor. He calls it the ecological niche of a transient mental illness. You need four key cultural aspects, four key cultural factors in which these, these epidemics, they need all four in which to thrive. And so multiple personality disorder, well, any, you need the medical world to legitimize it. It cannot become an epidemic unless the medical world legitimizes no, it. Not. So of course, psychiatry legitimized MPD in the 1980s, and right now is legitimizing gender dysphoria. Okay. The other thing is, of course, for it to spread, it needs to be observable. So MPD was all over talk shows. It was in, you know, a popular film, a book. You could see it. It was everywhere. MPD was in the culture. Again, look at now. Just look at now. Like mm. trends, the flags, the pronouns, the kids, it's everywhere. The influencers online, it's so observable. And then it's it's got to provide the person with some sort of release is what he says so it's a release that they can't get from anywhere else so the mpd women they were women who were, they felt left behind by feminism basically feminism had liberated women and many women were they were thriving because of feminism they were out in the workforce they were really successful they were doing very well but the MPD women, you could view them as the women who were left behind by feminism. They weren't thriving because they had all of a sudden to be a housewife was looked down upon. They didn't have a lot of meaning in their lives. They weren't thriving. And so to become a multiple, it gave them meaning in their lives. It gave them a release. It gave them purpose. people. Yeah, purpose. They were writing their journals. They were, they would, they had a special condition and everybody was focusing their attention. And again, look at now, if you compare it to now, the, the teenage girls, it's a release from puberty. It's yeah. a, the autistic girls. It's a release from social isolation. Like the release part is quite obvious, mm. but really the most crucial part and why I'm not worried about DID right now is because it needs something in the culture upon which it can it can latch it needs to be able to latch onto something very specific in the culture and mpd was latched onto the political child protection movement because if you if you remember multiple personality was supposedly caused by repressed memories of childhood sex sexual abuse and that was because 
that it, it sprang into being basically because everybody in the 1960s, 1970s was obsessed with child abuse because they had just discovered battered baby syndrome. X-rays were invented and they realized that like chill babies were being abused by their family members and that created the child protection movement. And then everyone was obsessed with it. Everybody was talking about child abuse all the time. It was in, it was a big political football, basically, like the modern mm. trans rights movement now. Everybody's obsessed with trans rights and we mm. get the gender dysphoria epidemic. Everybody then was obsessed with child abuse. The child protection movement was the political movement upon which MPD latched and then, and then that's how it spread. So. It's when the culture moves on, everybody moved on from the child protection movement. It, it was over, it was gone. And then MPD, well, the medical world, obviously it collapsed in an avalanche of lawsuits. So the medical side is gone and then the rest of it just disappeared. And so DID, I just don't see anything in the culture that it can latch onto and therefore it can spread. And so I think it's just going to be a weird TikTok trend. Just, it's almost like it's acting. I yeah. don't think it's, it's not really causing that much harm as, as of this yet. Stand. Yeah. You know, just the, the last for Ian Hacking's ecological niche, I cannot stress enough how strong the cultural the modern trans rights movement, the role that that plays in this epidemic that we're seeing, I cannot stress enough how important that is. You know, that is why we are in this mess because the modern trans rights movement was so aggressive in its messaging. You know, they, they targeted every layer of society with the idea that everyone possesses a gender identity and that it is your gender identity that makes you a man or a woman, a boy or a girl. We put that message into schools. We put that message into children's television shows. We put that message like Jazz Jen and Jennings, the reality TV show. That message was bombarded upon young people in a very crucial stage of their identity development. And then we triggered the social contagion of gender dysphoria. So as Hacking says in his analogy, just like any species, if you destroy one factor of its ecological niche, the species will disappear because it requires all of the factors in which to thrive. And so to get rid of, well, I, I'm not, I, people will misinterpret this. I am not saying, I'm not saying we have to get rid of the transgender community. I am saying that we have to get the social contagion, the psychiatric epidemic of gender dysphoria under control. And in order to do that, we've got to, I think we have to remove from our culture, the modern trans rights movements, pseudoscientific messaging. I think if we can bring everyone back to reality and stop talking about gender identities because they don't exist, Stop telling children that, you know, they can choose whether they're a boy or a girl, because that's not true. If we can bring everyone back to reality, we can take away the cultural moment that has created this epidemic. And I think that's going to be very difficult, but I think that's what we have to do. I think you're absolutely right. It ma makes me hopeful. I think, I think it has started to unravel already. No question. I mean, I am in Canada and I would like to be proved wrong on this, but I do believe that Canada will be the last bastion in this whole gender madness. I think really? I do. I do. I really think we are going to be the last country to put this right. And that's simply because I have been researching this and writing about this and speaking about this for years. And so I've watched all of the developments everywhere in Europe, in the US, everywhere around the world. And I've, I've also watched how none of it penetrates Canada. None of, it, none of it has any effect in Canada. We live in a bubble. We are insulated from all of the developments. And we are just 
dead set on this one path of affirmation and puberty blockers and medicalization and nothing seems to penetrate. So I do believe we'll be the last. But even in Canada, there are signs. I honestly think Europe is almost there. I think on the medical side, Europe is almost there. The political side with this whole yeah, idea of trans mm. women and women, that's going to be much more difficult to unpick. I hope that parents who find themselves in these situations uh, where they're confronted with, um, you know, doctor's recommendations um, that they now will use this as a, and, and write and ask the right questions. Yes, you see, my my heart breaks for the first wave of parents because the first wave when there was no information out there, nobody was talking about it and they were taken completely by surprise. Now I think of a, a, a child, you know, has some sort of gender presentation at school and comes home and decides to tell their parents that, you know, she tell, the daughter says, I'm now a boy. Now there's so much information out there that these parents are not going to be quite so caught off guard. Mm. I will say um, that we are in this mess. We are in this situation and this medical scandal has happened because of the attack on free speech. And because of the climate of fear, which made it so that nobody dared question this medical treatment, and that includes doctors, that includes psychiatrists, that includes teachers and the wider community, the climate of fear is how we have ended up with this medical crime unfolding before our very Absolutely. eyes, unfolding in plain sight. Mm. And so the way we end this is by talking about it. And it should be you should be talking about it at every possible opportunity. Like I am that person, obviously because of what I do and a standard small talk question is when you meet someone, they say, oh, what do you do? So I tell them, you know, and I'm that person, I go around and I talk about this everywhere I go in the, in the Uber, at the restaurant, and when I get my hair done. Real popular. <laughs> uh, believe me when I say everyone agrees with me. I've never had mm -hmm. a conversation and I've had hundreds of conversations. Really? I've never had because normal people do not support this. The tiny minority of trans activists who think that I am evil and I am genocidal and whatever, they are in the fraction of tiny minority, but they are the only people speaking. So it makes it feel as though everybody supports this. And, you know, that's why people are afraid to talk. But I can tell you, and I'm in Canada, this is one of the, the most extreme yeah. nations, supposedly, Everywhere I go, I talk about this and everyone always agrees with me because decent, normal people could never support such a medical crime. And so my advice to everyone is always the same. Talk about it. Just tell mm. people what's happening. And I guarantee that most people will agree with you. And if we, if we can break the spiral of silence, if we can just bring the conversation out into the open, we can end this a lot faster. Thank you so much. You speak about this like no one else, so eloquently and structured. Thank you so much. Thank you for Thank coming Thank you for on. having me. I'll take a little break now for Passover, but uh, we'll be back 8th of May. Going to continue on to expose everything that needs to be exposed in the psychiatric and psychological environment. See you next time.